The Zephyrus M16 from ASUS is a high-end, powerful, stylish gaming laptop with killer performance, a stunning screen, and a fatal flaw that makes it a completely unusable gaming machine. That is such a shame, because otherwise it's a pretty great laptop. So let me explain. Spec-wise, while you can pick this up in a variety of configurations, the one I have here is likely the one that I would generally head for, which is an i9-12900H, a 6P 8E core chip that in turbo mode and in its sort of peak configuration can hit 135 watts of peak power limit. Yeah. Also, 32 gigabytes of DDR5 4800 RAM, an RTX 3070 Ti laptop GPU with 8 gigabytes of VRAM, and a 2 terabyte sort of PCI Gen 4 SSD. That's not bad. And the performance isn't bad either. In its jet engine, sorry, I'm in turbo mode, it can hit literally chart topping game performance. Seriously, this thing can even beat the considerably thicker ARS 17 XE4. In CSGO, and that's not far from 400 FPS average, almost 75 FPS higher than the XE4. In Cyberpunk, it beats out the ARS machine by 5 FPS, running 116 FPS average, with some solid 1% low performance too. Watch Dogs is a full 20 FPS faster as well, although it is basically tied in its sort of balanced performance mode. Fortnite is again a solid win in turbo, running at 185 FPS average versus 169 from the XE4, although the non-turbo result does lag a little behind, although still very impressive, at around 150 FPS average. Microsoft Flight Simulator runs at 101 FPS average on medium settings, up from 85 on the XE4, and in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, you net 138 FPS average in turbo mode, or 123 in performance mode, compared to about 130 from the AR-17. Native resolution performance, that's 2560 by 1600, is expectedly lower, although still pretty decent. You can expect well over 60 FPS in pretty much any title on medium to high settings, and pushing for well over 100 FPS in the more, let's say, optimized titles. It's not quite enough to match the 165 Hz uh, display refresh rates in most cases, but it is decent enough, uh, or a decent enough experience for sure. Even the CPU specific, or the, the productivity performance, is standout. In the turbo mode, this is by far the fastest gaming laptop I have ever tested. In Cinebench R23, it ran at just shy of 19,000 points, or pretty much as fast as a desktop 12700K. That's incredible, especially from a laptop chip, and well exceeds the next fastest, uh, which is the 12700H in that AORUS machine that I've been going on about so far. And by over 3,000 points, or about 22% faster. That is kind of crazy. The single threaded performance gains are just as massive, running at just shy of 1,900 points, up from around 1,750 from the other 12th gen chips that I've tested. But by far the most surprising and impressive result comes from Blender, where the 12700H in this takes just over two minutes to render the BMW scene, again running 20% faster than the next fastest ship that I've tested. In Gooseberry, 20% goes a long way, with the M16 taking a little over 12 minutes to render the frame, down from 15 on the 12700Hs that I've tested previously, and the uh, AMD 6900HS in the Zephyrus G14. And actually, compared to my more recent Puget Bench Suite tests, again, in turbo mode, the M16 holds a reasonable lead in most cases. Premiere is a bit more of a, a soft win, but After Effects couldn't be more clear, nor could the result from Photoshop. The reason for all that performance, though, has uh, something to do with these little things called power limits. Because um, in turbo mode, like I mentioned earlier, the chips PL1, PL2, the power limit level figures, uh, they get locked to 135 watts. Yeah, you heard that right. 135 watts in something this 
thin and actually relatively light. Uh, it does hit 135 watts for about 5 seconds, and then it drops down to more like 107 watts in a more stable configuration. Of course, that is running at between 95 and 101 degrees Celsius the entire time, but the outright power or thermals aren't the, the fatal flaw with this machine though. Let me show you what it is. When you fire up a game and you start enjoying those sweet, sweet frames, you'll be having a great time for a bit, uh, but after about, let's say, five minutes, you might start to feel a little uncomfortable. After about 10 minutes, I think you'll be considering just stopping playing. And at the 15 minute mark, you'll probably just give up on the whole endeavor. Why? Well, let me just fire up my uh, my infrared temperature sensor and let's, let's point it at, I don't know, the, the T key. Ah, 55 degrees Celsius. Ouch. Even holding W starts getting uncomfortable rather quickly and pressing anything right over the D key becomes a no-go zone real fast. I physically couldn't game on this on a desk for more than about 15 to 20 minutes at a time. It hurt that much and that's what I would call a deal breaker. The key phrase there though was on a desk because if you lift this thing up off of your desk and give it a good amount of room to breathe in from the bottom, you get a completely different machine. I got 10 FPS more uh, average performance in Shadow of the Tomb Raider with a laptop lifted off of the, the desk surface. And the keyboard thermals were considerably better. Not fixed, it was still uncomfortable, but at least it was somewhat usable. I think I'm gonna do a full video on how much more performance you can get by lifting your laptop up, so do make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. Happily, the display is brilliant. While 16x10 isn't my personal preference of aspect ratios, the impressively crisp, rich, and vibrant panel does a great job for everything from gaming to content consumption and creation. In my testing, it peaks at around 500 nits of max brightness, which is plenty for most use cases, and will look good doing it, thanks to its 100% coverage of the DCI-P3 spectrum. It will even do that accurately, as I measured a delta E of under 1, which is just fantastic. Of course, this will drift over time, but especially for out-of-the-box performance, this is great. As for response times and for gaming, that's a bit of an interesting one. While my fairly strict methodology of a 5 RGB tolerance and including time spent overshooting reports an average of around 7 milliseconds, there are a few results that get pretty close, or at least close enough that a, a slightly more lax definition could call them, let's say, within the refresh rate of a window. You do get some overshoot though, which is unusual for a laptop. Until that is, you notice that in the ASUS Armory Crate software, there is a panel overdrive option that's enabled by default. Turning that off does get rid of the overshoot, but instead inter introduces the sort of mother of all slowdowns. The average slows to nearly 9 milliseconds, with the worst results taking between 12 and 14 to actually fully complete, or at least complete within the tolerance range, leading to a reasonable amount of ghosting on screen, as you can see in the UFO test. It's far from the worst I've seen though, and is still incredibly impressive, although it is a bit of a toss up for me personally between with overdrive on and off, which is more visible or more annoying for me. Personally, I think actively having the overdrive on can make it more distracting as the inverted ghosting you can see behind the UFO goes from just being a sort of, you know, ghosted frame to being a bright, brighter ghosted frame and that feels more distracting to me than just a slight sort of extra blur with the slower panel. As for the keyboard, when it's not on fire, it's okay. This is apparently their stealth type keyboard, and I'm not sure why, but I don't really like it that much. 
it just feels a, a little off when typing. It, it definitely feels possibly too light and maybe not enough sort of tactile feedback for me personally. It is perfectly usable, it's, it's perfectly fine, it's just maybe not my personal preference. The trackpad though is fantastic. It's large, easy to use, well supported, and has a, a great tactile click to it that just feels very nice and very premium. So. Good job there. Even the I.O. is decent enough with uh, two USB-C ports, one of which is Thunderbolt 4, two USB-A ports, one on either side, a headphone jack, Ethernet, DC in, a micro SD card reader, and an HDMI port. Taking a look inside the machine, you get a spare M.2 slot capable of running a full-speed PCI Gen 4 drive alongside partially upgradable RAM. I think half of your RAM or your 32 gigs is soldered to the other side of the PCB, with the other half being a sodium module that's right and available for you to switch out. Although good luck finding a sodium DDR5 module anytime soon and for any reasonable price tag. From the bottom, you can see where the CPU is. And oh look, that's where the hotspot on the keyboard is. Oh, that's funny. I wonder if that's a, an interesting coincidence that you're running 135 watts of heat through your fingers. Overall, if I forget the thermal issue, this is a damn impressive machine. Sporting literally top of the charts performance and a pretty top notch display, also a crazy thin bezel or thin sort of chassis, it would be easy to recommend this as a sort of halo tier product for something with a decent chunk of change to splash in a high end gaming laptop. But thanks to that unbearable heat, especially while gaming, I just can't see this as anything other than kind of one to avoid, really. Sure, you can have it lifted up 24-7 and then maybe it might be okay, but even then, it can still get uncomfortably hot and just makes it a bit of a, a no-go for me. With that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the M16? Is it a machine that you'd pick up yourself? Would you go with something maybe a little bit thicker, better thermals like the R17? Which I think if I was given the choice between the two, I think I would pick that one instead. Uh, feel free to let me know in the comments down below. As always, I will be leaving a link to this in the description if you do want to check it out and see pricing when and where you watch this. That's a global Amazon affiliate link that you can take a look at. And there's also a load of other ways that you can both stay up to date in the videos, like hitting the subscribe button and turning the bell notification icon on, or supporting the channel through uh, YouTube itself, through the YouTube join button, and get some uh, cool rewards, access to our Money Men Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and of course, a uh, a cool badge to have in the comments. Uh, you can also check out Patreon instead if you would rather, or merch hoodies or t-shirts like this one, and even some other affiliate links to places like Overclock UK if you're buying from there. That's all in the description for you to check out. Otherwise, there will be plenty of more videos on the end cards you can take a look at. Maybe take a look at the Aorus 17 XE4 review if you haven't already. I've gone on about it enough that you should probably check it out. Uh, and yeah, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.